Good day. This is Dr. Yeomans. I'm the medical director of the Psychiatry Consultation Liaison Service and the Brain Stimulation Service. And today I'm going to be presenting on the mental status exam. I will be doing a number of approximately 30 minute presentations, uh, beginning with the mental status exam and then going to the major psychotic disorders and then the major mood disorders, and, uh, personality disorders, and what have you. So you should have a copy of the slides, and we'll move on then to the first slide, and that is the objectives, and basically it's the appearance and behavior of the patient. Of course, you can extrapolate this to anybody that you know, um, be it family, be it uh, somebody in your social network, but I caution you not to um, readily diagnose somebody by meeting some of these objectives. The attitude towards the interpreter, the psychomotor activity, be it psychomotor agitation or psychomotor retardation. Affect and mood, which are different. Uh, speech and thought, and that is how somebody processes their thoughts. Perceptual disturbances, orientation and attention, their ability to focus, concentration and memory, intelligence and last, reliability judgment and insight. So we'll move on to slide number three and its appearance and behavior. And basically you can learn a lot or tell a lot about a patient or a person by the way they present themselves. And that could be how they dress, you know, how they appropriately dress for the weather, um, their gait, uh, is, there, is there any abnormal uh, posturing um, by their facial expressions, their mannerisms and level of grooming. Now underneath that is a kind of a way to describe somebody's appearance and behavior uh, in a uh, narrative form. Miss B, a Caucasian woman, was brought to the BHC Charlotte ED by her son because she had become increasingly hostile and combative at home and was staying up all night. She was restless during the interview, rising frequently from her chair, was hypervigilant and pervasively suspicious of the external stimuli, for example, the noise outside of the interview room. She looked her stated age, but her clothes would have been appropriate only for a much younger person. Although quite a obese, she wore orange hot pants and a halter top which showed a bare midriff. She wore old wooden beach sandals with spiked high heels. Her general level of grooming was very poor. Her short gray hair was matted on both sides up in a real irregular part. Her fingernails were long and yellow from nicotine. This is just kind of a demonstration of how to describe somebody's appearance and behavior. Moving on to the next slide is attitude towards the interviewer. Uh, how does the patient relate to you? Um, do they seem at ease? Are they guarded? Are they defensive? Uh, do they cooperate? Uh, or do you feel that they're uncooperative? Do they answer questions with adequate elaboration and self-disclosure? In other words, do they give you the information that you need, or do they withhold information, or do they give you too much information? Are they suspicious, uh, guarded, or defensive? Uh, hostility, uh, they may engage in one-upmanship, uh, and they may even attempt to embarrass or humiliate the interviewer. Uh, they may ask you questions, they may put you at ease, they may put you on the defensive by asking personal questions, asking how old you are, asking what kind of experience you have, what are your credentials. That is a way sometimes of engaging one-upmanship uh, and trying to make the interviewer uh, er, lose confidence uh, in their ability to complete a mental status exam. So they could be manipulative, they could be obsequious, there's any number of ways somebody could display an attitude towards the interpreter. Moving on to the next slide, psychomotor activity. This is a fairly uh, easy one to detect, psychomotor retardation. Um, general slowing of movement, it appears that they're walking through molasses. Uh, their speech uh, can be really soft, we say hypophonic. I mean, they're very, very hard to uh, understand what they're saying because they speak so softly. It could be very slow. Uh, and they'd be minimal facial expressions. They talking could seem to be an effort, in which we say they have underproductive speech. Um, they can answer after, uh, or they may not answer until after a prolonged latency. You see that with 
uh, profound depression. There may be frequent periods of silence. After you ask a question, that may be an example of um, thought blocking. And in other words, you're responding to internal stimuli. The thoughts can be uh, impoverished. So the, there's their speech can be underproductive, and their thoughts can be impoverished. And the opposite of psychomotor retardation is psychomotor agitation, acceleration, restlessness. And uh, means they, they're moving constantly, like in the narrative uh, um, from the first slide. They're hang, hand, hand ringing, and their, their feet are shuffling, they're crossing or uncrossing their knees, picking, scratching, nail biting, hair twisting, or pulling. Uh, they can get up from the chair and wander around the room. This could be due to the fact that they're responding to internal stimuli. It could be due to anxiety. Um, it could be due to a mood disorder such as mixed mania or mania. And last on the list is akathisia, and that is uh, what happens when some people um, have a, a, an abnormal response or a side effect to some of the antipsychotic medications. You see it more with the older antipsychotic medications like Haldol, and that's where people can have this inner restlessness. They actually can pace uh, in, uh, in, uh, in step. They can sit uh, in a chair and they can move their legs up and down as if they're walking while they're sitting. And that's what we call akathisia. Moving on to the next one, and that's affect and mood. The thing to remember about affect and mood is mood is the climate and affect is the weather. Uh, so affect is what you observe and mood is what the patient tells you about uh, how they're feeling. So mood is the climate, affect is the weather. Affect, what's the prevailing emotional tone? If people uh, are are well, they have a normal affect, they have a wide range of affect, they laugh when something's funny, they look somber uh, when they're sad uh, or painful issues are discussed. Um, affect should be congruent with the content of speech. We talk about abnormal affect, inappropriate affect is when the affect, their emotional tone, does uh, not coincide with the content of speech. So if they're crying, when they're telling you something that's funny or they're laughing when uh, you expect them to be sad, then that would be considered an inappropriate affect. Uh, so disturbance in appetite, hostility, uh, they're argumentative and antagonistic. Uh, Lability, uh, you see with patients with bipolar disorder, uh, they have rapid sh shifts in their affect. So they can rapidly go from happiness where they're giggling and laughing to sadness where they're sobbing and weeping or go from happiness to irritability. So it could be go, go from what appears to be a state of euphoria to a state of depression or a state of euphoria to uh, irritability. Any kind of a rapid shift in their uh, prevailing emotional tone. Inappropriate affect, which is what I just covered a moment ago. <clears throat> Again, you want their affect to be congruent with their content of speech. Constricted, blunted, flat affect um, is where they show no display of emotion. Uh, there's little to no variation in their facial expression. Mood is a subjective emotional experience by the patient over a period of time and therefore is based on a self-report. So mood is subjective and it's based on the self-report. Subjective feelings do not necessarily coincide with the affect, which is what I mentioned a moment ago. And you should specifically uh, record uh, the mood if you're doing a mental status exam and you're documenting the mental status exam. For example, I'm down in the dumps and can't seem to be able to pull myself out of it. That's a description of somebody's affect. I'm down in the dumps. Euthymic mood is how you describe somebody with a normal mood. There's absence of mood um, disturbance. Again, mood is the climate, affect is the weather, affect is the prevailing emotional tone, mood is the subjective emotional experience, and it's best to uh, quote the patient on that. Speech and thought is the slide seven, um, the loudness of their speech, aphonia, which means that they're moving their mouth, but they're not, uh, you can't hear anything. Uh, it's even below a whisper. Um, there can uh, be hypophonia, which is a really soft speech. It's very hard to hear what they're saying, but they are speaking. And um, uh, dysphonia is just a, a description of somebody who has a normal 
uh, uh, speech volume. Speed overproductive, uh, underproductive. Uh, with patients with mania, you see uh, often patients have overproductive speech. Patients with profound depression often have underproductive speech. It can be stilted, robotic, or pressured. Patients with mania sometimes can have pressured speech. In fact, they spit as they talk because they're trying to speak so fast. Well, how, what's the complexity or the uses of their words? Uh, can they come to the point? In other words, is there, is there speech and thought coherent? And dysarthria is a term we use more for a physical problem causing uh, disturbance in their speech. You see this with patients who have uh, had a stroke, um, um, that they, it's hard for them to, to, uh, to speak. Uh, the other neurological problems as well um, uh, are sometimes going to be a result of some of the uh, older conventional antipsychotic medications uh, that they have a difficult time speaking. And that's considered dysarthria. Moving on then to the next slide, slide eight, and that's speech and thought. So we're talking about thought process, and that is how does a patient communicate? Thought processes versus thought content. Process is how does a patient communicate to you? How do they put the words together? What's the sequence? What's the, the speed uh, of, their, of their thoughts? Uh, some examples of a dis disturbance in thought process circumstantiality, the answer questions in tedious and unnecessary detail uh, and circumlocution. For instance, you ask the patient, how did you get to the clinic today? And they tell you what kind of car they uh, drove in, uh, what kind of a make it is, uh, how much they get, uh, how many miles they get per, per gallon, and they go into a long description about the car, and then you say, well, tell me again, how did you get here? And they say, well, we left my house, well, my house is this. And we stopped at Starbucks. Well, we stopped at Starbucks because my sister wanted to get a Venti Bold. And then we were talking to uh, my neighbor in Starbucks. So they give you all this extra information. It's just tedious and unnecessary detail. Tangentiality is an oblique or totally irrelevant response. Flight of ideas. Um, some people can get, develop flight of ideas after drinking a lot of caffeinated beverages. You skip from one idea or thing to another, but they're associated. So you may say, I stopped. Uh, at Harris Teeter. Oh, by the way, at Harris Teeter, I ran into my cousin. You know, my cousin is an engineer. You know, where I went to school, engineering was really considered one of the better uh, programs. Well, the school was located in Cleveland. You know, in Cleveland, they just won the NBA title. So if you, you can trace their, um, their um, content of speech, uh, and you can actually trace it backwards. Uh, so there's an association between each of the different topics. Impoverished thoughts means that they have very little to say, and, and they, they just, you know, it's almost as if they have very little bit uh, uh, to communicate to you. Looseness of associations, um, basically what that is is when there's not a connection between different ideas. So they may say, I uh, stopped at Aristeter, you know that, uh, the, the guy that admitted me uh, to the unit, you know, he reminds me of, well, do you know that uh, um, in Chicago, um, they're, they're building this high rise and there's no connection uh, between, between the different associations. Clang associations um, means that uh, the associations are, are tenuous and they consist of rhymes uh, or puns. So on, on, a, on a scale, you can see uh, loose, looseness of associations. Um, what's worse than that would be considered disjointed speech. What's worse than that is considered fragmented thoughts. What's worse than that is considered word salad. And all this is in your handout. And moving on to slide nine. And this is, again, how the patient communicates uh, speech thought process. Uh, neologisms, it's when patients invent words, you see a lot with patients with psychotic disorders, they invent words that have meaning only to them. So for example, I'll just read the first uh, uh, paragraph of this, or first uh, line of this paragraph. In early times, men struggled uh, for the serenial of the human orator, comma, the lungs. Well, serenial is considered a neologism. There's a couple other neologisms in the paragraph, tinctured calcium and uh, energy. 
Oh, these are not words you find in the dictionary. These are actually neologisms. Perseveration is when patients adhere to the same words or concepts, and when they repeat the same word, repeat the same concept, you can't get them off of it. It's an obsessional uh, verbiage. Echolalia and echopraxia. Echolalia is irrelevant echoing or repeating of words used by the examiner or the interviewer, and echopraxia is repeating the movements of the uh, examiner or interviewer. Confabulation is what you uh, may see uh, in Korsakoff's uh, psychosis. Uh, this is a fabrication of information to fill in memory gaps. People with Wernicke's Korsakoff or Korsakoff psychosis have lapses in their memory and they make it up as they tell you their story. Thought blocking, sudden stoppage of thought, um, usually due to some kind of external stimuli, internal stimuli. Mutism and stupor you see in catatonia. Mutism is complete loss of speech. Some people may have elective or selective mutism. And stupor uh, is the total arrest of all motor activity, including speech, with little to no response to external stimuli. So speech and thought. Now let's talk about the content of speech, not the process. So they, now it's not how they present themselves, not what they tell you, it's not how they process their thoughts. Now let's talk about the content. Could be suicidality, uh, homicidality, uh, violence. This is part of their content of speech. Um, they could, um, uh, content could be obsessive ruminations. They would have repetitive and irrational ideas that in truth their conscious does not. When we talk about obsessive ruminations in psychiatry, it's not that you wake up in the morning, hear a song on the radio, and you can't get that song out of your head. Yes, it is an obsession, but in psychiatry, we talk about an obsessive rumination is when the thought seems foreign to you. It seems like it's outside of your head. It's not hearing voices, uh, but it's a thought that seems to be buried in your head, and it's we call it ego dystonic, which means it bothers you uh, and you don't want to do it. For instance, you might have the obsession that you want to tip over a, a hot bowl of soup <clears throat> and the thought keeps coming to your head, tip over the hot bowl of soup, tip over the hot bowl of soup. You don't want to do that. You have no intention to do that. And most of the time you would not do that, but it's an obsessive rumination. Uh, phobias, irrational fears, there's the, the whole list of different phobias, phobias to elevators and driving over bridges, and spiders, cats. Um, these are irrational fears. Agoraphobia is the worst kind of uh, phobic uh, avoidance that you can have once you're afraid to go outside of your home, you're afraid to go out in public, you're afraid to be out in open spaces. Um, there's social phobia, and, and again, there's a whole list of different phobias. Depersonalization is a feeling that one has changed. Patients will tell you that they feel like they're standing outside of their body. Uh, they just feel different, that they, they don't um, feel like they're within themselves. Derealization is feeling that the environment has changed. And now we talk about delusions, which is unshakable beliefs, faults, unshakable beliefs that are idiosyncratic to the individual and cannot be explained on a cultural basis. And this is very important that the second part of this um, description is it cannot be explained on a cultural basis. So if you're part of the charismatic uh, Christian renewal and you tell people you speak in tongues and the people get slain in the spirit, if you're part of this charismatic group of people who speak in tongues and what have you, then that's not considered a delusion because that's part of your culture. Uh, if you believe in rooting and that's part of uh, or being rooted, if that's part of your culture or people who believe in some of the voodoo practices and they live in an area, for instance, in uh, Louisiana or New Orleans. I mean, if that's part of their belief and that's part of their culture, it's not considered a delusion. So remember, it should be, cannot be explained on a cultural basis. And there's all different kinds of delusions. There's delusions of reference. We call the we say the patient has ideas of reference or the referential, persecutory, which is the most common, misidentification, they think somebody has been replaced by somebody else, jealous love, the, the common term for love delusion is erotomania, is when somebody thinks that somebody famous, for example, is in love with them, that the, the TV reporter is in love with them, they have a relationship with the TV reporter yet have never met with this person. Grandiose. You see that quite a bit of that in mania, a grandiose delusion, ill health, hypochondriacal delusion, 
guilt, poverty, nihilistic, and there's many others. Poverty and nihilistic illusions you see in geriatric patients uh, who believe they don't have a mon enough money to live on. They have this delusion of poverty. You speak to the family members, they say, oh yes, mom or dad or grandma or grandpa have plenty of money to live on. They're not poor, they're not impoverished. Nihilistic is when patients tell you that they feel like their body is decaying and their brain is decaying, uh, that you could sm they're telling you that you could smell them because you could smell the decay. They feel like they're literally uh, are, are falling apart. It used to be that the bizarre versus non-bizarre delusions would distinguish between delusional disorder, which we'll talk about at, at some other time, and a major psychotic disorder, for example, schizophrenia. Bizarre delusions would be, an, uh, an example of that would be if somebody told you that the margins landed in my backyard, they replaced my inner organs with the organs of a, of a pig. Now that would be a pretty bizarre delusion. A non-bizarre delusion might be when somebody says to you, I believe the police are after me. Yes, I've only had a one parking ticket, but I believe the, piece, the police are following me. Or organized, organized crime figures are following me from state to state. It is a delusion, you, you hope, um, but that's considered a non-bizarre delusion. And sometimes that can differentiate between a delusional disorder and a major psychotic disorder. Perceptual disturbances, um, just to give you the difference between an illusion versus an hallucination. An illusion is a misperception of an actual stimuli. So for instance, you, you wake up in a, in a dimly lit room and you think there's a person standing there and actually it's just a clothes tree. Um, you're, you're washing your hands and for a moment it looks like it's blood coming out of the faucet. Well, there, there actually is a stimuli, it's the water coming out of the faucet. That actually would be considered an illusion because it, it's a misperception of an actual stimuli because you've got the water pouring on your hand where you feel like it might be blood or you think you see somebody in the room and it's actually a closed street. Hallucination is a perception without an external stimuli. So illusion, there is an actual stimuli. Hallucination, no external stimuli. There's many kinds of... Um, Hallucinations, the more, more, more common ones are auditory, visual, olfactory, uh, and um, tactile. And just uh, to, for the sake of completeness, you may hear the term hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations. Hypnagogic hallucinations is what occurs as somebody is falling asleep. Hypnopompic hallucination is what occurs when people are waking up from their sleep. And this is what you would see with narcolepsy. And basically what it is, it's a REM breakthrough period in their stage one sleep. So they are actually having hallucinations, but it's actually the hallucinations you would have in a dream state. And that you see with narcolepsy. It's always good to ask, when do you have these external stimuli or these uh, hallucinations? So orientation, uh, this is one of the easier ones. You know, it's always good, if anything, as a patient identifier, ask the patient their full name and ask them their date of birth and tell them that, you know, I want to be sure I have the right patient. So please tell me your full name and please give me your date of birth. This is always good as a patient identifier. It's also good to assess their orientation. Year, month, day of the month, day of the week. Surprisingly, a lot of people get confused when you say day of the week. They think you mean the day of the month. Sometimes you have to coach them. You may say, well, is it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? And then they'll catch on what you're asking. What state, what city, what location are you in? And, and, and number four is situation. And this is, tell me why we're meeting right now. Um, what is your understanding of this interview? Um, you get some really bizarre responses, especially if patients are delirious. Um, just the other day, I was interviewing a patient in the intensive care unit that was delirious. She could give me her correct date of birth, her correct age, and then I asked her where she was right now, and she said she was in Home Depot. I said, and without correcting her, I said, well, why, why are you here? And I didn't want to say Home Depot, and she said, I'm looking for a part for my uh, vacuum cleaner. Um, so um, it's always good to get an idea of what they see is why uh, do they see you as the, as the um, minister, as the pastor, do they see you as the police officer, do they see you as an FBI agent, do they see you as whomever. Uh, it's good to get an idea of why they think they're meeting with you. So that's the four spears, person, place, time, and situation. 
So clear sensorium is what you hope most people will have. With delirium, you can see a fluctuating sensori uh, sensorium. Um, they can appear uh, uh, oriented um, at 2 o'clock, at 4 o'clock you interview them and they're disoriented. Their sensorium is fluctuating and that's one of the hallmarks of delirium, their sensation, their sensorium, I'm sorry, is fluctuating. Dementia um, is where you can get evening disorientation, um, what's called sundowning. Moving on to the next slide, and that is attention, concentration, and memory. Uh, immediate uh, is repeating something uh, back to you. Uh, for instance, it's always good to say to a patient, if you're doing a full mental status exam, I'm going to name off three objects. Dog, pencil, apple. Could you repeat those for me? That's considered, and if they can do that, then they have adequate immediate memory. Short term is what's your memory within five minutes or so. And you can actually say to them five minutes or so afterwards, remember I asked you to name them off those three objects. Can you tell me what they are? Do you recall what those three objects were? And that's a way to assess your short term memory. Long term is weeks uh, and days. You can ask them, what did you have for dinner last night? What did you do last weekend? People should, who have adequate memory, should to remember this. Remote memory is months or years. It's always good to ask them what do you expect they would remember, like what year did you graduate from high school, what year did you get married, what year did you uh, get uh, discharged from the military service, a date uh, that they're most likely to remember. Street address is always a good one, digits forward and backwards, so you can say we'll spell the word world forward and spell the word world backwards. Always ask them to spell it forward before you ask them to spell it backwards. You can ask them to name the months forwards and backwards. Start with February and go backwards. Um, and then you can do serial sevens. Uh, again, you can do the months backwards. Uh, there's any ways to, you can uh, test their concentration. There's two uh, formal tests. There's a mini mental set exam and the 3MS, which, which will uh, assess their memory in a little more detail. Next slide is intelligence. You know, what about the vocabulary? Uh, well, this is going to depend on their education, but it gives you a clue to their intellectual functioning. It doesn't mean that they're bored on intellectual functioning. It doesn't mean that they're mentally retarded. Because you have to take into account their, their education, but focus on their vocabulary. Calculations, for instance, uh, give them an example of somebody, if you were to have 97 cents, you were to buy something for 15 cents, how much would you have left? Well, now you're going to buy something with, for 13 cents, how much would you have left? That's just to determine uh, how they can calculate. Abstract ability. Um, this can be fun to do because you can get some really bizarre responses. But one is similarities. So how is a hammer and a screwdriver alike? How are they similar? Well, they're both um, tools. Um, how is an apple and orange alike? Well, they're both pieces of fruit. How are a tree and an elephant alike? Well, they're both, they both have trunks. So there's any kind of uh, similarities. And then proverbs, and you can come up with a lot more similarities in proverbs. But with proverbs, you can ask them, what does it mean when they say, don't cry over spilled milk? What does it mean when they say, a stitch in time saves nine? Uh, so, and again, you can use other ones as well. Those are just a couple examples of similarities in, in Proverbs. And uh, you can get an idea of how people, not only their intelligent level, but, you know, can, uh, can they think abstractly. Reliability, judgment, and insight. How reliable are they? Uh, are they honest? Do they pay attention to detail? Uh, do they seem motivated to give you the information that you need to know? Examples, histrionic patient. Um, Reports are colored by exaggeration, retrospective falsification. Antisocial patients will tell you bold faced lies to get out of trouble. Borderline intellectual functioning patients may make up facts to avoid embarrassment that cover up their cognitive limitations. Manic patients uh, can uh, give you very grandiose statements. I'm quoting a statement of somebody that I work with. And he said, I am scheduled to speak in front of 150,000 people at the Panthers Stadium Saturday night on my stimulus package that I will personally underwrite. And this is a patient uh, with mania. Um, reliability, judgment, and insight. Judgment, it's good, to, it's good to get an overall idea of their historical judgment. 
For instance, uh, if they get admitted to the hospital and you read in the uh, history of present illness, they were walking out in public with uh, gym shorts and flip-flops and it's 20 degrees below zero. Well, their overall judgment, their, their historical judgment is poor. You can test their judgment, it's called formal judgment, and you can ask them, what would you do if there was smoke in the theater? Hopefully most people would say, I would get up, pull the fire alarm, I would let the uh, the person working at the theater know that I smelled the smoke. I like the one where you ask somebody, what would you do if a child came up to you in a shopping mall and said he couldn't find his parents? Well, hopefully they would take the child to the uh, information booth. Hopefully they would take him to the to the closest security guard. Um, you would get some you will get some interesting responses to that, and that's formal judgment. That's something you would test. An insight is: Does the patient have an adequate awareness of what the problem is, and and do they? Um, have any idea of the causes in reasonable uh, solutions. And the last slide at 17, I'm going to, that's just uh, um, just in case you're interested in a little more information about memory, uh, the five A's of schizophrenia and symptoms of Wernicke's, actually Korsakoff's uh, syndrome, and you can look that over yourself. So that's the presentation on the mental studies exam. I will be doing another presentation on the major psychotic disorders uh, next, and um, thank you for your time.